Hello and welcome back. This is Dr. Mellon um, with our Mostly True Psychiatry kind of series. We're going to be talking about delirium in one hour or less. So topics we're going to cover today, the DSM definition. We're going to go over diagnosis, kind of what they approach, what, how they come to you in real life, some case examples, um, the short version of, of causes, the, ideo the ideology, um, how you would do the mental status exam, risk factors, predisposing and precipitating factors, some important changes that occur as we age with uh, basically as far as your like your actual um, physiology changes that are relevant for your treatment. And we'll talk about assessment generally, diagnosis generally, and how you tell the difference between delirium um, and just being dementia because a lot of patients are, have dementia and then delirium is, is added on to that. Labs and imaging, that talk about uh, general and specific plans uh, or patient populations and how you're treating them. Um, and then we will go over note writing, some of the high points. So delirium, diagnosis, criteria A, B, and C are the, actually through D are the big ones. So the DSM says um, a, for criteria A, a disturbance in attention, specifically reduced ability to direct focus sustain or shift attention. Um, often accompanied by a reduction in general awareness of the environment. The disturbance develops over a short period of time, right? Hours to days represents a change from their baseline. It's not just dementia type thing. Uh, it tends to fluctuate in severity throughout the day. There's additional disturbances are commonly present or have to be for the full diagnosis. You have a, either a memory deficit, you know, short, intermediate, long-term kind of issues disorientation, they don't know where they are, or they're in a gas station or the mall, not the hospital. Uh, language changes, they're confused, they have perceptual different um, difficulties or visual spatial ability gets messed up. And then you're looking for kind of um, disturbances to be due to a medical condition that you're showing is present and it does not, and it's not just like they have um, um, low awareness of the environment, and that's a change due to something else, um, specifically coma um, or kind of brain trauma there. And then they break it down into is a specifier saying it's, a, it's acute versus uh, long or persistent, sorry, acute versus persistent. So if it's delirium and it's gone within a few days, whatever you want to call that, you say acute. If it's weeks to months, then you can call it persistent. And, but notice it says months, so delirium can last a long time. And then it's your level of arousal and, and arousal and your interaction with the outside environments. So they do have a differentiation between hyperactive, hypoactive, or mixed um, level of activity. Hyperactive, hypoactive, commonly been used for years now. It's not just new to the DSM-5 TR. So hyperactive is means they have like increased psychomotor activity. It may be accompanied by that mood lability or changes, whether it's anxiety, agitation. They're just refusing care to interact with, with the medical staff. Um, Hypoactive is a person who has a reduced level of awareness, psychomotor changes, like they're, they're not moving a lot, low energy, um, not really like physically moving much, sleeping a lot, sluggish, lethargic kind of seeming, and then mixed where just sometimes they're more hyperactive, sometimes they're hypoactive, and you're getting both. So that would be like the geriatric patient, and they call it like sundowning is one of those terms they like to use in those situations where they're, during the day they're sleeping all day, and then their sleep-wake cycle's messed up, and they're all real active at night. Um, and psychotic and causing difficulties. Rough breakdown is hypoactive is uh, more common than hyperactive, kind of a two to one ratio, 40%, 20%. And then a third overall roughly is uh, that mixed state where sometimes they're hypoactive and sometimes they're hyperactive. You can further specify this way. I don't think many people do it in practice, but you could say, you know, why it is. You could say it's um, delirium, you know, the specifier being substance intoxication delirium. So it's right, it's they've been on benzos, alcohol type thing, or, you know, cocaine, and they're currently um, just inebriated and psychotic, and they're then tired and kind of go back and forth and have a delirium um, picture, or more likely like withdrawals from like benzos and alcohol. Um, and that goes from the intoxication versus withdrawal. Um, medication induced, so, you know, if you have a lot of anticholinergics, you overdose toxicity kind of thing, or some other meds, then you can get delirium. Um, if it's due to a um, medical condition, so the classic UTI, C, um, CHF kind of patient, um, just or um, like you know fractured hip, and they just had surgery, that kind of stuff. 
and then delirium due to multiple etiologies. So there's more than one cause. You can't really point at it. So it's two or more. It's electrolytes plus, you know, um, hip fracture. There's the other specified delirium that you're allowed to use. Um, so this is, does it meet the full criteria? And you want to specify why it doesn't. And so you're um, giving a specific reasoning. Unspecified delirium, you're not even saying, um, it doesn't meet the full criteria. You're not saying why, but you're still doing treatment probably. All right, so what does a diagnosis of delirium look like in real life? What will your consults look like? You have a geriatric patient with new onset schizophrenia or mania. Never the case, right? Like that's, that's not a 70 year old with schizophrenia or just diagnosed. Or the patient's sleeping all the time, but then they may be depressed after surgery. And that's not a good way to describe it, but you might get that consult. You have a suspected delirium patient. It's geriatric, they're very, they're very ill, frail, agitated, psychotic, and exit seeking. That's a good consult, right? Like they, they um, understand that it is delirium and you're not trying to diagnose it for them. Um, so the presentations you're looking for is somebody who's elderly, they're medically sick now, they have a change in behavior from baseline within a few days, like, you know, that would be like they were in the hospital for three or four days, they had um, surgery, getting treated for UTI, indwelling catheter, still there, but whatever type of thing, and they started to get really weird after a few days. Uh, goldfish attention span, so they just, they can't pay attention to what's going on, they can't focus, they can't concentrate, they have that altered um, level of awareness. Disturbed sleep-wake cycle, so they're sleeping all the time and they're awake all night from the nurse's um, note. They're emotionally dysregulated now, right? They're getting angry, they're agitated, they're getting um, very, very anxious and scared or you know depressed seeming all of a sudden. So um, a new kind of psychosis popping up, especially if it's like a complex with visual hallucinations, right? That's uh, one of the red flags you're supposed to always think about when you're saying is it a um, organic versus inorganic um, psychosis is um, if it's a inorganic so the schizophrenia you know bipolar is, um, with current like mania or depression uh, that kind of um, where it's actually got psychotic features you're looking for most like auditory hallucinations you know some delusions things of that nature but when it's actual brain um, like encephalopathy issues trauma to your brain that kind of stuff or you're, you've got delirium from, from the medical situation or, or medications, you'll often get, you'll get the same thing like Alzheimer's and stuff too, where you get that visual hallucinations and they're really like complicated, specific, like it's little children running around or little, you know, it's little animals that are well formed and making sounds and moving around. And that's, that's more of an organic picture. So you're looking for that organic psychosis. And then the typical hyperactive signs, you're looking for an agitated, hyperkinetic, moving around a lot, exit seeking, refusing medical care. That looks like a hyperactive um, delirium. For a hypoactive delirium, it's a person who has a severely reduced level of consciousness. They're hard to wake up. You're having, they're falling asleep during the interview. That's, you know, that looks exactly like delirium when it's hypoactive. The consults aren't random. You're not just getting consulted, you know, for hyperactive and hypoactive patients and stuff. It's the doc, the primary care team wants specific things, and that's why you're there. So the, it's almost always for hyperactive delirium. It's not for the patient who's tired and they're trying to work on their medical stuff and they're not causing any difficulties. It's it's the it's hyperactive one. It's when the patients are refusing treatment and they need it but they can't get it, and they're trying to trying to get the antibiotics. And in the patient, it takes an IV because they have a bone infection and they won't take it. That kind of thing. The patient's just trying to leave, right, against AMA, at, you know, against medical advice. And they're like, "No, you need to keep getting your, you know, your treatment, or you might just die in the next, you know, 12 hours or something." The patient's agitated and fighting staff, and they're having a hard time with them. That's going to get a consult. So, kind of. Three case examples, what they, you know, real examples, this is what they look like. It'd be like a 79 year old male, patient with a past medical history of um, AFib. They brought into the EMS from home due to vomiting large amounts of bright red blood this morning, right? And that person ends up having delirium. A 72 year old female consulted for management of delirium, just specifically with severe anxiety in a setting of a status post hip surgery yesterday. An 80 year old man with a past medical history of dementia, because dementia is a huge risk factor admitted for delirium, precipitated whoops, by pneumonia and a UTI, and then they got bacteremia. Psychiatrist consulted due to a persistent agitation. So the etiologies, I'm not gonna go into really for this conversation um, today, 
The short answer is nobody knows what the real cause is. There's just a laundry list of things that affect it and are known to be um, correlations and potentially multiple causations, right? There's more than one way to have your brain just generally dysfunction. So neurotransmitters, you know, it's been acetylcholine, norepinephrine, dopamine, glutamate um, for various reasons because you can cause a person to be um, act like they have delirium, hyperactive delirium type symptoms with, with, acetyl, with those different um, uh, pathways that are, that are using those neurotransmitters. There's corticosteroid theory of what's going on and kind of a, and then there's an inflam, neuroinflammatory story that's used. There's neuronal networks. It's kind of the hot new thing on the block, and it's it's saying it's more about the general pathways and, and brain states um, that are it's being more limited or it's not cycling properly through them. And there's um, glial cell activity because the glial cells make up over half the brain, and everybody ignores them for these kind of things. But um, a lot of um, like microglia control aspects of neuron activity and um, changes, and just like as a general statement. Um, glial cells can cause alteration in neural fi firing patterns within hours, which, you know, basically meets the same timeline of delirium. So they could be largely important. Who knows? What does the mental status exam look like? So appearance, behavior, speech, you're looking for somebody who's poor, um, poorly groomed, poor hygiene. They might lose bowel function all of a sudden and nobody mentions it other than just, you know, patient basically had urinary incontinence and they act like that's normal. 75, don't they just pee on themselves and they, they can't control their bowel functions anymore? No, no, that's not part of being older. It's just like, um, it's a, just like a generic statement, especially if that wasn't the case for them before. So, um, the speech is incoherent and disorganized. If they're hypoactive, then you're getting psychomotor retardation, they're asleep, they're falling asleep during the interview can't arouse them during the interview, you know, you're trying to sternal rub them to get them to wake up. Hyperactive um, delirium, so these are, they have psychomotor agitation, they're kind of moving around, they're restless kind of thing. Uncooperative, hostile, labile um, emotions, where they're putting anxious, agitated, dysphoria, or whatever. They're getting up and trying to leave hospital, you know, these, that's a behavior. Affect, so if they're hypoactive, they're sedated, tired, typically euthymic, blunted affect, that kind of thing. Hyperactive, you're going to say they're, they're agitated, irritable, angry, anxious, dysphoric, that kind of thing. Or they're just euthymic at that time, right? It's, it fluctuates. That's one of the problems with this. So to some degree, other than getting the extreme answers to the middle SAS exam, it doesn't matter too much on um, this part of it. Sensorium, um, typically they're oriented to themselves and that's it. Sometimes they know they're in a hospital. Um, can't really tell you why. They're not really sure. Um, often that deficit in awareness, so if we go back to diagnostic criteria from the DSM, that's part of A, disturbance of attention, accompanied by reduced awareness of the environment. Cognition, this is, this is where all the money is, this is what's important. So poor attention is the essential diagnostic feature of delirium. You need this, you need this, you need this. Attention is the essential diagnostic feature of delirium, a poor attention, sorry. So let's do a side trip and just Kind of explore i've done this in other videos on how you do attention testing so so since that is the core piece to it that they have a poor attention and you gotta know how to test attention right so there's many ways to test this you should do a few sequentially to help convince yourself it's actual defect at that time and remember that the patient's going to try to deceive you they're you know they're not going to want to do the testing they're going to come up with excuses and it doesn't they don't really matter they're going to tell you they're tired they're bad at math they're too old they're never good at spelling none of those are good excuses you just bulldog it keep going be nice but you you just make sure you actually test their attention legitimately uh easiest most common kind of version is order reversal you take something and, and then you flip it around backwards and see if they can do it so it's not the typical um, way of managing that information and it requires concentration focus attention so words are very easy pick a five letter word see if they can spell it forward so the common words are table world earth the other one that's actually pretty common is their own name as long as it's not three letters or 40. Um, even if it's 40 you probably still do it to be honest and then all you do is you tell them to start saying it backwards and so w-o-r-l-d so they can spell world and they proved it before they do it backwards so it's not just they can't spell and then they go d-l-r-o-w days of the week so you tell them to start with sunday and then go backwards saturday friday etc months of the year same thing then you, you do responding to letters or numbers so um what you should just say is like i'm gonna say 10 letters whenever you hear the letter a tap on your desk do you have any questions about the instructions? 
Do you know what to do? Okay, good. And then you'd put a three second pause between each letter. So it's gotta take a while. You don't wanna do it in 10 seconds, even if they just kinda of tap, because you, you need that, you need a long enough time frame to be able to really judge if they can do it or not. So the most common ones are using like the mnemonic word things or whatever, like the word spellings is save a heart, Casablanca, a bad, bad day. I don't like a bad, bad day. It's misspelled so weirdly, I can't remember it, but uh, it just needs to have lots of A's and stuff and it's 10 letters, so it's like S, a, V, you know, and do that through it. You can do it with numbers, but realistically, unless you've memorized 10 numbers and keep them your whole life, or you sit there and write them down, you're never, it'll never be a first line choice for you. But 10 numbers, don't pick a pattern, you know, tap your finger when you say number one, two, three, whatever number you want. Sentence writing, another one nobody will ever do, but it's very straightforward and easy. Um, you're basically just giving them a long sentence, you're giving them little chunks of it at a time, and they just keep writing, and you have, um, see if they can do it, right? So uh, here's a random sentence. He drove to the store in a van to pick up the gummy bears that he wanted to give to his child that afternoon at the basketball game. There doesn't matter what the sentence is. You just gotta make sure you're breaking up and doing it slow enough that they can keep writing. So he drove to the store in a van. You just sit there and write, and when they're done, and you see that they're done, and you go to pick up the gummy bears that he wanted to give his child, let him do it, and go through. Um, so thought process, content, next part of the, of the MSE mental status exam. New onset psychosis, very common, almost 50%, right? So it's 40%, it's gonna be there a lot. Visual hallucinations that are well formed being the primary ones of, of interest. Um, they'll, you know, they, they may or may not know the, um, have good or, they may or not, may not have good insight in that situation. Probably not for delirium. Um, if it was more like, um, Somebody with Parkinson's disease, they're gonna know that they're not, it's not real. Alzheimer's even oft sometimes knows that they're not real, that kind of thing. Um, you're looking for really disorganized thinking. It's super common. Delusions are there pretty often. Auditory hallucinations are actually fairly rare, but don't make that a rule out for any reason. Remember, you can be quietly psychotic. So, um, you know, if a person looks super agitated in their sleep and they're like thrashing or they're kind of moaning, wake up, it's like they might be having some really scary, you know, it might be pain, but it might also be that they're having some really severe, distressing psychosis and they're just hypoactive. Judgment insight basically, you should be writing absent or poor if they have actual delirium because they should be absent or poor you know, in that situation. Um, meaning the patient does not have capacity to make medical decisions. It's super important, right? So general way of thinking about the risk factors. So delirium has lots of risk factors. Um, and you're gonna have to write them in your notes. You're gonna have to uh, use it as part of the whole process and seeing and trying to control as many as you can. So patients, uh, general way to think about them. So patients with a lower cognitive and physical reserves, frail, old, um, so like a frail old person, delir uh, dementia kind of patients, those are the, that's really high risk, have less capacity to maintain a normal brain functioning in response to a stress. So um, the more significant of a systemic insult they're having, like a UTI versus a, you know a major, like an MBA, uh, motor vehicle accident with you know multiple traumas from it, then that would have a much higher risk for delirium than just having a UTI. And then you're also saying this like um, in a different way, conversely kind of thing. A young, healthy patient may need to be seriously critically ill in order to develop delirium, um, and it may just last a couple hours and they're back to normal. Versus a, ge a geriatric patient may only need a UTI to get there. Um, risk factors are often broken up into categories. So they talk about predisposing risk factors. So it predisposes, it's before, it's the fuel that, that you're gonna be putting into the fire later. So that's a pre-existing risk for delirium. Then there's a precipitating factor, the thing that actually caused the episode of delirium, the spark that's starting that fire. And then you have perpetuating factors. So factors that are maintaining the delirium. Um, so why is it still ongoing? Like you have an infection that they haven't gotten rid of the bacteremia yet. There's over a hundred risk factors that have been described. You know, take it for what it's worth. There's just look for the big ones. So age and general frailty, huge risk factor. So they kind of estimated that risk. They say um, if starting at 65 and then going forward every year after age 65, it's about a 2% risk for delirium once you end up in the hospital. 
So at 86 years old, you have like a 40% chance of getting delirium with any kind of significant hospitalization. Poorly controlled pain is a large risk factor for post-operative settings because, right, you're a, you have um, you're in a lot more kind of general distress. Your neurotransmitters, if they have anything to do with it, are going crazy. Inflammation could be going crazy in that situation. Um, also, you're not sleeping well, and that's if you're not sleeping, that's going to make things worse. In the ICU, blood transfusions and benzodiazepines, even when they're giving it like um, IV continuous, these are major modifiable risk factors for delirium. Maybe if you need blood transfusion, you need a blood transfusion. Benzos um, were noted to cause a lot of delirium, especially if they did 20 milligrams in a day um, when it was a continuous infusion. And that's a lot of the arguments of why um, we're using other meds now for sedation agitation in ICU. The big predisposing factors generally are the cognitive impairment. If they have you know, Parkinson's or dementia or things like Alzheimer's, whatever, when they come in, that's a huge risk factor. If they have the, um, the number and severity of those comorbid illnesses, so the more they have and the more severe they are, the more risk factor is. If they have functional impairment, they can't see, they can't hear, they can't move around because paralysis of legs, whatever, like that, that's a problem. As we said, age is a huge risk factor going starting after 65. Um, chronic renal insufficiency, a big one. Your meds are going to get messed up. Your electrolytes will get messed up. Dehydration, malnutrition. Low serum albumin, so that's kind of a sign of, of liver dysfunction. Um, and it's also just like, it could be like a sign of like severe alcoholism or things of that, that nature. Depression is the specific risk factor when it comes to psychiatric illnesses, uh, vision and hearing um, impairments, immobilizations. Um, substance use disorder, currently using just, you know, had, just withdrawing, that kind of stuff. Or if they were taking five medications, you can just call that and write it down as a major, you know, predisposing risk factor for, for polypharmacy. High risk medications are usually reported as benzos, opiates, and steroids. If they have a lot of anticholinergics, that would be one as well. Um, if they've changed medications recently, or if they have acute um, medical illness right now, almost, you know, usually going to be the case. If they have an electrolyte or metabolic abnormalities that are significant, we'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, low blood pressure, recent surgery. Um, so these are precipitating. I'm sorry, shoot, I should have said that. So these are things that, so these are predisposing. Now precipitating are things that caused it today, right? So low blood pressure today, surgery today, electrolyte, metabolic um, abnormalities today. Uh, medication changes are on those medications. Inadequate pain relief, so again, like we just said, um, if they're not controlling their pain, it causes lots of problems. If they've had a stroke recently, has an ongoing infection, recent um, drug or alcohol use, uh, major psychological stressor, generally death of a family member, think of that kind of thing, or a sleep disturbance. Okay, geriatric changes. So there's a few things just, you know, this is not super specific, but just things to be aware of. Um, it's, it's not exhaustive by any means. So when, as we age, there are certain changes that happen to our kind of um, pathophysiology concept. So you have a reduced elimination capacity of the kidneys and livers, right? They don't process meds as fast. They build up easier. Um, you have dis decreased water distribution in the body. You have decreased lean body mass. You have um, an increased body fat percentage. Albumin does slowly go down as we age, kind of going along with the you know, slow disrepair of the liver as we age. So making the diagnosis, um, force for the trees kind of concept. So psychiatry is not important for delirium treatment at all if the patient could die shortly, right? Like if you think the patient's going to die, you don't matter. So if the patient is delirious because they could die, stop everything, pick up the phone, and don't act like a psychiatrist, right? Call somebody, do what you need to do, um, start the initial treatment, get the primary team, whatever. Call a code on them if you need to for additional like help and services in that situation, whatever your, your hospital does. So the red flags, if they're hypoxic um, to a significant degree, like less than 88% and it's sitting there. Um, low blood pressure, malignant hypertension, so either extreme is a big issue. Um, Low glucose usually is a bigger issue than high. I mean, it could be either, but low is the one that's going to just kick it off quickly. For the, um, if they've had a, or kind of still having heart attacks or just, just had one, maybe a silent MI, people didn't notice. If they're, they might have a current brain um, bleed or stroke is the cause of the delirium. 
drug intoxication withdrawal. This is where you can act like a psychiatrist, to be honest. So benzos, alcohol, lithium toxicity. So um, benzodiazepine withdrawal. If that's happened, you just restart the home dose because um, they've only been out for like a day or so or start slightly low if you want um, because it's caused by that. It's not like a regular delirium. Uh, if it's alcohol, you start a seawall or whatever your place does, evaluate for an encephaloth, um, cephalopathy. You have to get, if you're going to give glucose for some reason, thiamine has to be given first. If they have an anticholinergic toxicity, don't really know that this will ever be an issue or happen. It's more of like a book question. So I guess they try to eating fertilizer or something. I don't know. Um, then you could just, I would still just do recommend. I wouldn't, I would do any of the treatment. Just recommend like physostigmine. It's 0.5 to 2 milligrams. Slow IV push. They need a rescue. Um, as a rescue drug in that situation when you're trying to fix it. But um, yeah, don't, don't, don't go through that. Remember that you're the consult and you're not managing the delirium. So when you're doing your diagnosis and treatment, remember you're, you're not there to like treat the delirium, right? You're just right, you're recommending causes and avenues for further investigation to the primary team. You're treating the behavior. If you believe that you need some kind of specialty workup, then it might be something not done. You can recommend it. Don't worry if you don't know how to do it. You just like autoimmune concerns, you know, consider CSF and autoantibody testing um, for disorders like, and put one or two, you know, SLE or whatever. Um, all right, so how do we do it? So it's a clinical diagnosis. There's no paperwork needed. You don't need to do a little testing scale or anything. It's a clinical diagnosis that meets the criteria for the DSM for us. So you need situational awareness for, or have a baseline suspicion. So you're doing a hospital service with like CNL, you have an old patient, illness, surgery, weird extreme behavior starts, they're exit seeking despite the need for care. And that all happened, you know, two or three days after they arrived. You want evidence of predisposing factors for delirium that we talked about. You want evidence of precipitating and um, the perpetuating factors as well that we talked about. Um, it's going to be like a new onset psychosis in a geriatric patient. You've done some cognitive testing and you see they have disturbed attention. They have just, they're disoriented to the situation, right? They're alert and oriented times one, maybe two. Um, and they have a limited perception and an adequate response to the environment, right? So hypo, if it's a hypoactive patient, hypoact, um, delirium that with hypoactive. Um, collateral information, super helpful. What was their baseline, you know, cognitive functioning? Is this just a mention? Is what they always act like? You know, how do you know? You can't. Lost the ability to think with the usual clarity or coherence from that, clar from that collateral information. Um, and then you need, you need to know the difference in what a psychosis looks like typically between organic versus inorganic, but don't use that as an absolute, you know. They're hearing voices. I know it's delirium, but they don't see anything. It's just hearing. It can still be delirium, but that's just not typical. Ability to diagnose a patient with delirium who has pre-existing dementia, very important. So let's go through that. So this is like a little just junk table. It appears in some form of this in lots of books. So you say um, the characteristics are on the left-hand column and then there's delirium in one column and then dementia. So we're looking for differences and I'm gonna put the differences in blue. So attention, so it's impaired, right? That's, that's one of those core features. It's reduced awareness environment and impaired uh, attention. It needs to be there for delirium. Dementia, it's usually normal until a very late stage. Like you can say, hi, John, hi, um, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine, you know, they can talk to you. Um, psychomotor changes, so if it's a hyperactive uh, delirium, then it can be increased, but it's often normal, so uh, you won't be able to get much out of that most of the time. Um, onset, right, it's acute versus gradual. Hallucinations, it's typically um, not present in dementia, again, until late stages or some, um, and it's going to be often the visual, so we've said two or three times already. Memory. So this is something to be aware of. So immediate memory. This like you say something like apple table penny, and they repeat it back to you. Apple table penny. People with delirium a lot of times can't do that, or they just keep messing it up. You do a bunch of them, you do like two or three in a row, different thing. And they just start messing up. But you know, somebody with Alzheimer's can can say the three words back to you. Um, speech and thinking should be a big difference. It's not obvious to new psychiatrists, but because uh, you just don't quite know how to evaluate what you're looking at, it's not intuitive. But the, you're looking for when they're delirious, it's incoherent, they're disorganized um, thinking. 
dementia, they're really, they're just, it's impoverished. They don't say a lot of different words. They have a lot of word finding problems. Um, they'll use kind of vague words a lot to, I'm fine, it's good. They just don't wanna, they can't give a lot of specific adjectives, noun verbs that are helpful. Um, but it's impoverished, You can, it's, it's not incoherent. Those are different. So the vital signs of concern when you're looking at this is like the, um, I would, you know, these are just my opinion, whatever. Um, I'm concerned probably somebody when they're having all these symptoms that it look like delirium and if their systolic is like in, you know, 180 or above for, or diastolic's over 100 or if, um, if they're less than 90, less than 60 or if it's low and the systolic and diastolic are pretty even because the heart's not really working well on either side, all those things would, would concern me. Um, heart rate, as long as it's not a fit person, you know, um, you don't have a weirdo marathon runner got in a car wreck and now they're delirious, but the heart rate's 44, 45, that's normal for that person. But everybody else, you know, and they're old and not very fit, um, if the heart rate's really low, it's, it's staying under 50s or it's staying over 100s, that's a problem. You know, have refall it and recheck a single thing and it's like 102, who cares? But if it's there consistently, like 105, 110, 115, then now I'd, I'd be concerned. Respiratory rate, again, just persistently staying outside of that 10 to 20 range. SpO2, under eight, you know, people that have COPD live at 88%, right? And they'll give them oxygen or whatever, but they they live at that level without the oxygen. Um, so less than 88%, probably a problem. You, you're going to give them oxygen either way if they're like under 92 or whatever the hospital pro the protocol is where you are. Um, absolute weight monitoring, because if basically it's for people with like CHF kind of problems or like liver problems and they start third third spacing, fluid's not moving around, they start gaining a bunch of weight, they have low albumin, that kind of thing, because they have a bunch of fluid building up on them. That's, you know, you want to monitor for, for that for these patients. So the basic labs that everybody should get, um, I, would, I would always have a CBC, right? That's your anemia infection kind of concepts, a CMP, lots of stuff there. You know, if it's off, matters. So it's like potassium, sodium, creat, um, creatine, creatinine, no, sorry, um, creatine. <laughs> Uh, calcium, albumin, and remember you need magnesium in those situations because if magnesium's not correct, the other electrolytes aren't correct, and there's a there's conversion um, correction formulas. Uh, UA is important for infection, chest X-ray, same thing. EKG because you want if you're going to be get, giving antipsychotics, it's important. UDS uh, uh, if they recently been on drugs or something like that that's causing this is a um, precipitating factor. And then you look at that and decide if, if those were precipitating factors, and then you kind of you know, try to fix them, cause, and you're going to monitor them while they're sick. So what that means every day, every two or three days, depends how sick they are, what's going on. But, um, you know, it's, and sometimes it's serial lab testing for, um, you know, catheters or, or is the antibiotic working or something for the infection or serial x-rays to see if it's getting better, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes you, you're not sure what's causing the, the delirium, so you need more labs to identify the cause. So just recommend types of workups that you want, like I said earlier. Don't worry if you don't know what the right answer is. If you do, you can just recommend it. If not, you can be somewhat vague, that's fine. Just be clear on what you actually want to be tested for, even if you don't know how. So. EEGs, I'm going to do this part kind of brief um, for today in this situation, but you don't want it or need it basically for most um, delirium situations. The basic reasoning is you're getting consulted for a hyperactive delirium and they're not going to sit still to do the EEG, so good luck with that. So it can provide evidence of delirium um, it, and um, it can basically be that differential diagnosis for a PC, you know, like, oh, look, they've been having a seizure for the last hour and I couldn't tell the difference. Um, if it's catatonia, dementia, psychosis, none of those things look anything like, or, you know, yeah, they don't really look anything like a person with delirium. And then one in five is not going to be right. You have know, false positives, so whatever. And it's not worth doing. Um, it, it's more of an academic thing, I think, in most situations. Not practical. Not super helpful. EKG, you need it because you're going to probably give um, antipsychotics because that's why they want to get you, is to help them with behaviors. Um, QTC is the big issue here, so if it's over 450 um, or a 25% change from baseline, you should probably get a cardiology consult, um, let them be aware of it, and consider not giving antipsychotics. So a quick, easy way to think about this, I think, is you'd say um, Haldol, um, QTC, plus 5. It's not much. Some of the studies show that if you're like under, if you're not giving more than 2.53 milligrams a day, it may have no differences realistically. And then you have like Zeprazidone, um, which 
Um, is a real big problem for this one. That's why it's not super common to give it for folks and because you can't do it IV or anything for these folks very well, but um, you can do it IM, um, is a 20 millisecond, so real big risk factor. Um, so if you're trying to say the safest one because of, of QTC issues, probably quetiapine is your best bet. There's two ways that people typically evaluate um, QTC prolongation. Um, I typically just use the Bezet, um, the Bezet corrected QTC values for a diagnosis of QT prolongation. Um, I, I don't, actually, I don't know if I, um, so if it's prolonged, I think generally, I don't agree with actually the advice I just said a minute ago. Um, so it says QTC greater than 450 because they're uh, cardiology consults. I, I wouldn't do that, I'm sorry. I miss I miss wrote there. I'd probably say if it's like um, 490, something like that, not not 450. Um, so um, QTC interval will the basic variable that messes up that evaluation um, is that really rapid and really short heart rates, well outside of the 60 to 100 range. Um, it's going to mess up the automated readings um, and the formulas that are used. Depends some form, some one some formulas are better in other situations. I think the Bezet corrected QTC typically starts to have problems when the heart rate gets real high, like 120 or above. But other than that, um, men and women have different cutoff lines. It's probably just more you know epidemiology than anything else, just seeing what the risks are. Uh, adult male, use 450 as a cutoff as being um, prolonged QTC. For an adult female, you're gonna use 470. Um, and this is the corrected QTC, right? You're not using the baseline QTC. You're using the corrected QTC on the EKG. It's typically automatically re read out for us. Brain imaging, why would you do it? We're trying to identify strokes, hemorrhaging, brain trauma, you know, structural abnormality like cancer, that kind of thing. Um, let me get water for a second. So you're doing it because you think something is visible in the brain that's going to be a problem. or potentially is present and it's a problem. Don't do it on everybody. So when to order it, uh, focal neurological sign. They got that weird, you know, limp all of a sudden, they're peeing on themselves all of a sudden and defecating their, um, they had a shake episode and now their face is like not responding, drooping, you know, something weird, a weakness, that kind of thing. Um, they've had reduced level of consciousness, they're fine and they just crash out. Um, if they've, um, had a fall recently, right? If they have, they fell and then they have reduced level of consciousness is noted, and then you might have a brain bleed, especially if they're on um, head in, if they have a head injury during that fall or taking anticoagulants. Which bonus fact? Aspirin's no longer promoted for helping people as they get older. That was taken off by the USPTF, I think, last year, year before, but I don't think a lot of doctors know that yet. When not to order brain imaging. Do not order it if they have dementia and a known cause, like a UTI. It's fine. It's fine. You know what caused it. Start treating the UTI if you're, you're done. Um, and it's because it's unlikely to help or change any of the actual treatment. Let me fix that spelling. I'm going to waste your time for a second while I'm here because I will forget. I'm going to put 490 here just to have a big enough change to make myself happy because these are my opinions, not, not necessarily perfect or facts. Um, purpose of an EEG is to diagnose, oh wait, we did this, sorry. Yeah, we already did that, sorry. So it's a hypo, um, hypoactive delirium patient. You're confused about if what you're looking at or it's catatonia or something and not sure how to diagnose catatonia. Um, I've got another video on that. You should just watch the catatonia one. So what do you do when you don't know what's causing the delirium, but you're like, it's delirium. I still want to, I still want that. Um, so additional testing can be done. Um, these are just some examples. It's not going to be definitive. So your Hail Mary options, so CSF, right, antibody infection, things like that. Um, urine porphyrins, even less likely. ABG, right, maybe they are they're, have a slower, fast respiratory rate, and they could actually be just building up carbon dioxide, and, and that's, that's a problem to get an acidotic. Um, you could do specific imaging for an area of concern like GI, nervous system, you know, um, was it gandolinium or whatever for if you're looking at infections of the spine or something, for like fungal infections. But um, just start imaging other parts of the body, right, where, where it might be if, uh, if they have a reason that that would be where it is. 
So how do we, what's our plan? What are our plan with these folks? Um, what, are we, what, is our, what are our ideas of what we might be thinking for treatment? First, to know that you're treating agitation, you're treating intolerable distress in a setting of a medical illness. That's what you're treating. You're treating agitation and intolerable distress. That's it. Don't use chemical restraints. Don't make it look like you're using chemical restraints. Now, having said that, it's very reasonable that you're afraid of side effects of your medication, and so you schedule your one milligram of Haldol twice a day because we don't want to cause side effects. There you go, you got it twice a day, um, instead of saying two milligrams at night. Um, or, you know, um, can offer, you know, a milligram to them if they're distressed and agitated and the patient with, um, is having difficulties. But whatever your hospital says, write it in a way where you don't get sued or, you know, they don't attack you and say you're a bad person. So don't write anything that looks like a chemical restraint, you know, and don't do a chemical restraint. Don't just be like, I don't want to go back down there. That's twice today. I am, I'm twice today, you know, PRN, whatever. Just leave me alone. That's, don't be a terrible human being. So prohibited uses of restraints is, um, so it's when it's based solely on patient's prior history or behavior. So you can't use restraints on people in general, chemical or physical. Sorry, there's gonna be a little bit of this is a restraint um, statement real quick for a couple things. You cannot give any kind of restraints or order restraints when it's based solely on a patient's prior history and or behavior. <laughs> you don't put restraints for convenience of the staff, right? Soft four point restrictions because they're walking around. It's annoying, I don't want them to fall. It can't be, you can't give restraints as a method of control, coercion, or punishment. You take this medication oral or I'm tying you down. Bad doctor. How do you write the restraint note? You don't have to do it. It's the licensed um, individual practitioner, aka the attending usually. And so they're gonna write down, you know, their name, the patient being restrained, the date and time of the restraint, or the, the verbal order often with the thing given. The type of restraint has to be specified in the duration of the restraint. So it's always there. You must how to, when you're treating delirium generally, you must know how to treat conservatively and safely given the specifics of organ dysfunction. So you must know how to educate the, both the primary care team and the RNs about delirium so they know what's going on and what to expect and you know, help them with their tolerance of their you know, abnormal behavior that's going on. It's best if you actually have a um, pre-made educational content um, in your assessment for them to help them out. Your role in it is managing agitation, exit-seeking behavior. That's what you're letting them know. That's what you're doing. And writing that the patient lacks medical decision-making capacity. That's kind of important, especially if the primary team doesn't do it. Um, everybody wants delirium to go away. Fast, fast, fast. Give them med. Get them out here. Get them out of the place. Get a new one in. Give them med. Get them out. You know, cycle, cycle, cycle. Um, but delirium significantly improves in most people, usually, three to seven days. I don't think seven days is fast. That's a week in the hospital, and you're just in before you have like a 50% improvement or something. You know, still, you know, so 35%. So a third of patients are delirious at a month. 30% of patients are delirious at one month. Almost half are delirious still when they're discharged. So, um, this is not fast. Uh, some people it is, but it, it definitely does not need to be fast. For all patients, your kind of general plan for everybody, you know, it's early mobilization. That's really about ICU patients. It will reduce the length, but it could just tell, mean that you're saying whoever moves around best is the one who doesn't stay delirious as long. You need to promote a normal sleep cycle. Lots of ways to do that. You do earplugs, you pull the blind shut at night, you open up the blind so there's sunshine during the day. You consider things to help them sleep at night. Melatonin, trazodone's fine. A lot of institutions don't use trazodone, but it's, it's a way to get them to sleep, so why not? And it's not gonna cause a lot of problems with other drugs and stuff. Um, doesn't worsen delirium or anything. Sound machines, right? White noise, brown noise, if you wanna be fancy. Uh, quieter at night generally don't open the door 400 times leave the door cracked with the sitter there so, um, whatever those kind of things don't check on them too much at night if you don't need to um, hearing aids and glasses are available to help them with their sensory stuff during the day you know, tell the family to get them from home 
have the patient wear hearing aids and glasses when they're talking to you, you know, that kind of thing. Make sure they're being hydrated, they're getting their nutrition, they didn't just skip food for two days because eh, they wouldn't take food, IV it, do whatever. Like don't don't just sit there and do no nutrition for days and be like, well, they won't take it and it's annoying. Um, adequate pain management, like we've discussed, reorientate them very often. It's part of your education you're given for the nursing staff and stuff. You, need, you can put a clock in the room saying what time of the day it is and keep pointing at it, telling what time of the day it is. Make sure that they're using the restroom appropriately. Um, if they need laxatives or whatever, go for it, right? Bladder and bowel management. Promote familiar surroundings, it's always said, um, right? So it's familiar picture of the family. You know, that, that's pretty much the one that's always given as an example. Better yet, have a family member present at all times and tell them it's important if they want their loved one to get better or if, you know, they end up falling and breaking a hip and stuff because the family won't stay and help, you know, the family could be helping. Um, all right, specific treatment that when it's hypoactive delirium. Po, po, low, not doing anything, hypoactive. Basic delirium plan is always monitor for red flags. Those are that we talked about, right? The low blood pressure, sugar issues. Continue to treat or search for underlying causes of the delirium. Consider need of new or repeat labs. Monitor for worsening medical picture. Manage the environment for safety and orientation. Safety being don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. Um, or pull something out of your body or punch people or whatever. Maintain adequate nutrition hydration. Manage pain. Try to go ahead and get a surrogate medical decision maker. There's a order, you know, of, of decision makers depending on your state. Typically, it'll be your spouse first if that person's available. Educate the staff um, plus family about what delirium is, what you expect over time. Um, medication considerations: consider melatonin three milligrams at night to promote the day-night cycle. Probably doesn't work. If it does, helps one in twenty people. Then sure, it's just do it. It's not going to hurt anything. If it helps one one day for one person, then you know you charge fifty bucks to save somebody a thousand or something. Um, monitor for change to a mixed delirium. Right? They just because they start off hypoactive doesn't mean they can't become mixed. Remember, the patient may be psychotic while hypoactive active. Make sure they're not really distressed, even though they're not causing other people particular problems. Um, and you don't need any specific medication treatment for these folks. Hyperactive, the reason you get 90% of the consults, um, you do that hypoactive stuff plus you're gonna, you need to start evaluating to understand when you're, because you're gonna be giving medications, what are the major medical caveats to their treatment? Like, do they have Parkinson's disease? because antipsychotics will worsen Parkinson's disease symptoms. Um, so you might need to consider like quetiapine is the one that's the, you know, has the least chance of causing significant worsening and it's given for two Parkinson's patients you know, who aren't delirious as a drug. Um, and benzos is maybe a choice. Does a patient have severe liver dysfunction, right? So if they, they have hepatic, significant hepatic impairment, liver dysfunction. Antipsychotics still work fine. Just super low dose. You have to go super slow because it's not. If, if that's part of that breakdown to to clearance or something, um, it might take a long time to clear, and so it'll build up real fast in their body. Um, a lot higher than you're intending to give. Um, lorazepam is okay because that's more of the kidney clearance drug. Does the patient have severe kidney dysfunction? So think gabapentin bad is a specific drug. It's that's not a good choice. And a psychotics will still work just fine. You're just going to start with a low dose. And then they talk about the drugs that are mostly cleared by the kidney or the, as being the lot benzodiazepines. So that's lorazepam, oxazepam, temazepam. Instant side note and then move on because I'm not going to go into it in this lecture. They are all worked on by the liver. It's completely a wrong concept when people are like, oh, lot drugs, and lot benzodiazepines are just cleared by the liver and, or by the kidneys and they're not, they're not worked on by the liver. Totally wrong, totally wrong. But it's all a matter of degrees. So, you know, just like somebody has severe liver dysfunction, you can still give an antipsychotic. So the lot drugs typically are a good choice if they have liver damage, not a great choice if they um, have really bad kidney damage. Does a patient have severe respiratory dysfunction? So severe COPD patient, right? Think benzos are bad, respiratory suppression. I don't care if you've never seen a healthy person with a truckload of benzos get it done. This is the patient you don't want to test. Benzos are bad if they have severe respiratory dysfunction. Antipsychotics, fine, they don't affect respiratory. Does the patient have cardiac dysfunction? So think antipsychotics are bad 
as a concept saying QTC elongation. So we said Haldol, maybe nothing when it's a little, um, when it's really, really long, Zeprazidone, definite no. Quetiapine's, so then it's like Risperidone, Zeprazidone, bad. Quetiapine, okay, Haldol maybe. Um, depends on who you are and your, your, your comfort level, but evidence shows it's, it's actually quite safe, QTC for a couple milligrams. And then benzos are fine, obviously. Does a patient have epilepsy or a recent seizure? Antipsychotics generally lower the seizure risk, um, you know, for a stable epilepsy. So um, if it definitely is a risk factor, you gotta really think twice, three times. Uncontrolled seizures, you don't give antipsychotics, that's, you're gonna get sued. Um, AEDs, right, anti-epileptic drugs, great choice. So valproic acid, gabapentin. You're just doubling down on the, on the basic problem or issue. Okay, sorry, that was a long one. Treatment of healthy delirium patient. So if you have a healthy delirium patient, that's basically somebody who doesn't have Parkinson's disease, no major organ dysfunction, then you just use any general first line antipsychotic or that's used for the treatment when we get to, for those when we get to them. So good reasons for prescribing medications for delirium. Agitation, distressing, psychosis. Not just, I see a dog, it's running there, there's no dog here, ah, oh, bam, held all. Like, no, don't do that, don't do that. Um, intolerable distress, anxiety generally, and if there's a lot of self-harm risk, they're not gonna take their meds, they're falling down out of the bed, they're exit seeking, and it's important that they get treatment. Bad reasons for prescribing medications for delirium. So it's just because, it's mostly conceptual here, right? So medications do not reduce the duration of delirium full stop, period, don't care what med you give. It does not reduce the duration of the delirium itself. It doesn't reduce the, the length of the hospital stay. So I know we're treating agitation, doing all this stuff, it doesn't slow down the hospital stay by treating it. They do not reduce mortality, and this is like that first 30 days out, you know, when they walk out of the hospital, did they die when they went home or something? So it's been about 10 studies have looked at it, they pulled them all together as well. It, it, it doesn't, giving them meds for this, even, even though you're increasing, by giving the meds, hopefully reducing the risk of them get, like getting out of bed and falling and punching people, pulling meds out, pulling lines out and stuff. The antipsychotics themselves apparently don't really help if you're gonna die or not, even with all that said. Um, could be debated. Psychiatric treatment of delirium is based on clinical experience. So how, you, how much you're giving and what you're doing, it's based on your own personal experience. And why? There's no high quality evidence of choices. Let that sink in. None. I know that sucks. <laughs> so this is just everybody's afraid. Go to the psychiatrist. We're gonna we're gonna be the ones to be the the heroes here, and we just gotta do our best based on our clinical experience. In fact, there's no medications approved by the United States, the U.S. F um, FDA, for the treatment of delirium. None of them say for delirium. None. Nothing that we give. Everything's off label. Because despite what all that said above, you know, as far as FDA and those things, it's what we do, it's what we have to do, so it's commonly a first line, it's just off-label, like half of the things psychiatry gets stuck doing, um, so go for it, um, and just really realize you're treating behaviors, not the delirium, and I think it's reasonable for most situations, just think you're going to be treating for like three to five days, um, it's kind of the idea with the antipsychotics or benzos, whatever you're doing, so how do you prescribe them? It's a basic thing you do for geriatric frail, all the folks like that. You start low, go slow, our kids. You know, pay attention to EPS and akathisia a lot. The side effects risks are a lot higher for them. Um, so watch out for dystonias or, or, you know, and maybe they're not agitated and you're like, oh, they were seeing stuff before and scared. Now they're running around and making people you know, frightened with like big, big wide eyes. Like, well, you could have caused problems with your Haldol or, or Risperidone you gave. The medication preference is you should always, if you're able to, you always want to give oral. Second choice is oral dissolving tablet. You know, is now just be because they can't, maybe they can't swallow real well, but they're they're willing to. Um, IV, IVs don't hurt. IMs hurt. Don't stab people in the arm. So if they have an IV, use the IV. Um, so you have to just figure out what's available, like how you can get the medication into them. So the IM concerns, or it's, it's probably more or less the same for IV. But for IM generally, like the blanket statements, even if it's like a young agitated patient who's in your acute unit, 
I am, you should really think twice about doing it in a third and fourth time. If they have a serious cardiac defect and you're like that prolonged QTC, unstable epilepsy, a recent overdose with drugs, or a head injury. Um, basically, the head injury evidence is all first generation um, antipsychotics. So, a major reason you're picking what specific treatment you're doing is based on that organ dysfunction, drug drug interactions and whether or not they have Parkinson's disease. On day one, you need to see the patient twice, right? That's your goal. Go rapid, go in early, and then come back later because you need to evaluate what the next couple days are gonna look like, and you're not gonna know what your first dose. There's no, no way, you shouldn't assume. So, you know, you give the medication 30, 45, 60 minutes later, you, go, you come again to see how the patient's doing. Are they super calm and relaxed, or just it doesn't look like you gave them anything? And if they did, then you can repeat that dose again and then see and then check again. You need to see what dose actually works or, you know, reasonably could work to get through that first 24 hours. And so the basic prescribing pattern concept you should have in your head on um, how to manage these patients when like how, how much do I give how often that kind of thing. And what time of the day is it's going to be like this. Step one, you're going to give your medication a choice given the, the variables from the previous slide. You're gonna follow up the same day to make a frequency and a dosing choice. So if it's a mild patient, maybe it's scheduled as a nightly drug and then PRN one, one to two times a day to help them out. Um, but they have to be willing to take it in those situations. You're not forcing it. It's not scheduled. If it's moderate to you, it's, it's, not, this, it's not the borderline case. It's like it's pretty bad. Um, then you're going to basically schedule a dose for morning and night with another PRN or two, depending on which drug you pick. Um, usually just one more PRN, but if it has a short half-life, the drug you picked, like lorazepam, you might need two. If it's severe, I would just say you're giving it to help reduce side effects, right? Um, but you're going to schedule it three times a day, and then once you can offer. So you're doing it A, B, C, morning, um, morning noon, night, morning, noon, night. Um, and it's not unreasonable on a lot of drugs to try. If, if, if it's not the same dose all throughout the day, you get more at night because you really want them to sleep and less during the day. So then you're going to evaluate for over sedation and, and when you can wean. Is, is there an opportunity to wean today or not? So the, when you start the weaning process, the first change you should make is to take the daytime doses that you have scheduled and flip it over to being PRN. So first changes you're making is you're making a PRN during the daytime. The last change you make is taking that nighttime dose and changing it from schedule to PRN. So the day becomes PRN, then the nighttime. So um, I'm not going to say a whole bunch on these. You can see them, screenshot them, do whatever. Uh, when you're treating uh, patients uh, delirium who have Parkinson's disease, this is kind of some organ dysfunction and thought process of what you can do. I, it's just kind of, I built this from personal experience plus just other journals and research articles, what they, um, how they looked at it. Um, so I just put first, second, third line. You really want to do first line. Everything after that gets real scary. But, um, and then I put in some options of what you could do as oral versus what can't be done as oral. Not, um, so like, just as, a, as an example, if you have a Parkinson's patient and they don't have any organ problems, you know, quetiapine is a great choice. Go for it. It's easy. It feels like the right thing to do. But if their lungs and kidney are no good, then trazodone. You got to do something weird because they have Parkinson's disease, right? This is not a normal patient. Um, and it goes through options. Uh, these are reasonable. Um, just with all delirium patients, you know, you just have to be careful. So if they do not, without, have Parkinson's disease, they, but they have delirium, here's an, this is another drug table of what you could do. So now when you have no organ dysfunction, you've got lots of choices, right? So if it's oral, you can do quetiapine, haloperidol, olanzapine, risperidone. They're all fine. Pick your favorite. Your attending might be like, oh, it's agitation, and they do it for autistic folks, and they do it for kids. Risperidone is the best thing ever. It, it doesn't help with delirium any more than the other drugs. When it, there's, there's no evidence for it. it. That's garbage. I don't care what the drug company says. Um, or you're attending probably for that matter if they if they think it's going to help these delirious patients more for this particular case example it's there's no evidence for that um, yeah so you go first second third line and then you pick the organs that are broken so this is my dosing table um, I'm going to pause for a second so you can just stare at it and be scared 
All right. So it's not that bad. Um, so the things that I put into it is if you look under the first um, the first column, it's the drug, and it tells you the formulation you can get, right? So haloperidol is awesome because, you know, you can eat it as a Tic Tac or gummy if you want. It's in everything. It's like all formulations, like IV, IM, oral, solution. It's, it's, it, it works no matter what. So, um, and then the second column, I'll say the starting dose for a frail or geriatric patient is an option. And then in parentheses below it is somebody who's basically healthy, middle-aged. They're, they're not the scary patient. So as an example, you know, I might only start with 0.25 milligrams for Haldol for somebody if they're really scary, but a young, healthy person who just had severe trauma, extubated, brought down from ICU, and they're still kind of delirious, maybe a milligram's fine, you know, four times the dose of what you're starting the, that frail, scary patient for. And then it's gonna have an increasing, um, a column for how you'd increase it, so it's per dose. So you could go just tiny, 0.25 each time if they're scary for haloperidol, or 0.5 to 1, whatever you think is right, um, for the um, healthier, middle-aged kind of person. Um, bad patients, good patients, special note sections. This is kind of just for what's relevant in an acute situation. So a bad patient is, you know, somebody who has severe EPS, extrapyramidal symptoms risks, right? So that person has Parkinson's disease or whatever, then don't give haloperidol to them. Um, you know, you can give it to them with organ dysfunctions, like whether it's liver or kidney. Um, it's great if they're really agitated. And you need to know maybe something about the special note on the side. So um, this is a reasonable table, give you an idea of what you're doing um, and what what is a safe-ish way of doing all these things. As a resident, you're pretty much going to just be recommending all of this to your attending, seeing what they do, and they go, oh, yeah, it's always going to be, well, lands up being 2.5, or everybody's getting held all 0.5. You're going to kind of do what they tell you, or you've seen a few times, and then you just keep doing whatever that attending's comfortable with. But these are all normal, easy options. Um, yep, I don't think there's much more to say on that. So uh, you can't see the gabapentin stuff. So gabapentin, if I go down, um, is that seizure risk, high anxiety, and a poor evidence for the um, general benefit in delirium, to be honest. So, uh, benzos, stick with two. Don't go crazy. Don't pick different ones. Lorazepam and clonazepam are perfectly good options forever for you. Um, you don't. You have a real short acting and a real long acting. One that goes through the liver. One that goes through the kidneys. Um, you can do B fifty two if you need to for for these patients, um, but really be scared when they have delirium doing B fifty two. Don't go because um, these aren't normal patients that are just angry and young and high on drugs or something or whatever. Um, melatonin, you know, it doesn't matter. You just kind of start through milligrams, go up to 10, hope, hope it helps, whatever, uh, may or may not. Um, for the ad, um, AEDs, so anti-epilepsy drugs, it's gabapentin, pregabalin, valproic acid can be used. There are certain patients, like if they've had head trauma and they're having seizures or whatever, that might be a good choice of medication. So um, it might be a good, a good idea just to have a generic legal statement at the bottom of your, pa of your patients with delirium, that are, especially if they're geriatric and you're giving um, antipsychotics is something along the lines of mortality rates are increased in elderly patients receiving antipsychotics. However, in the case of um, this patient's delirium, safety concerns, including not receiving necessary medical care and falls, are deemed to outweigh the risks of short-term antipsychotic treatment. Continuous considerations of risks and benefits will be evaluated, and the minimal dose for, um, for the least amount of time will be used, right? so. Uh, that's something like that would be would be a good idea. Um, so when you're writing your notes, um, these are things you should include on your assessment plan. If collateral information was available, what their pre-morbid functioning is, and if it's different now, you know, behaviors. Uh, and that's you know, it's like were they already low intellectual functioning or something like that before? Like, or were they just normal walkie talky person, and now they're all confused. Uh, behaviors of particular interest, so the things that you're treating, right? It's agitation, intolerable distress, um, distressing, you know, um, visual hallucinations. State the reasons that you're treating um, for, for the delirium diagnosis. So it's kind of predisposing um, factors and precipitating factors. And if you feel confident in it or, or you can see it and it's obvious to you, you can put what is um, perpetuating as well.
the current um, um, delirium. And then you're going to go over the current medical situation and write it down. So, you know, they've had recent surgery, anesthesia, they have acute medical conditions, organ um, functioning issues, abnormal labs or imaging, treatments being given, including the dose or frequency, things of that nature. What are the red flags of concern? Focal neurological signs, a typical presentation. Uh, are there like paucity of delirium risk factors and they're acting like this? Then maybe you're like, you might want to image their brain. Maybe they're having a stroke, you know. And so that would be a way that you could, if that's the case, you put it in there is they have um, paucity of delirium risk factors. Uh, make sure that you're not being weird and you can tell that it's serotonin syndrome or NMS and, you know, they're stiff and shaky, diarrhea or something going on. Um, drugs that they're withdrawing or toxicity. Additional diagnostic and monitoring needs, right? Those are those um, labs, imaging, frequency of vital signs, like make it continuous or whatever you need. Um, any further roll in, roll outs, that kind of stuff. Medical decision making surrogate, if you can identify them, you should. So if you have that family member, you should, you should name them and put them in. It's their spouse or whatever. Uh, I don't want to go through the rest because it depends on, on your state. Um, so. That's the short version. There's, I've, um, I've got a lot more information on this, and I might do a longer version at some point, but it won't be in the near future. And these were the sources I kind of used to do it. So if you want to be able to see them, there they are. So, All right, hopefully that was helpful. I'll see you guys later. Bye.